Hello. How are you? There's no one here. I'm talking to myself. <sighs> Which is not atypical. I wish that it was. But maybe someday someone will come and watch me talk to myself about the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter. We'll see. We'll drink some coffee. I narrate it as it happens. It's lukewarm. We're off to a great start. Ah, uh, doo doop doo Hello, Linda. How you doing? We'll give it just a little bit and see if anybody else wants to pop over to say hello Nathan good afternoon how are you my friend hey Pat how's it going Cheryl, how are you? Mike, great to see you. Hey, Sue. Jean, good to see you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I am live on Facebook. Steve, Beth, Bobby Joe, how's it going? The crew is here. Let's jump in. We are on uh, John chapter 5 uh, about... Halfway through, uh, Jesus is um, responding to the, the Pharisees, uh, the Jews, uh, who were very upset that he would dare to, to heal somebody on the Sabbath day. Uh, hey, Stanley. So remember, Jesus, uh, on, the, on the Passover, on the Sabbath day, by the uh, sheep gate, heals the paralytic who had laid by the pool at Bethsaida, where he wished to go for a, a swim to to receive uh, his 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 continence back uh, to to receive his ability to 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 walk to control his body to to live his life. Uh, Jesus steps in uh, not as a replacement to the water, but as the source of the water's power, and he heals this man on the Passover, on the Sabbath, and everybody's real upset, like. Because, uh, after all, uh, they have it in their heads that the Sabbath is uh, not a day that is something uh, where God would work something for them. But the, the Passover, or the Seder, the, the Sabbath, would be all about what we would do for God. And of course, well, we, we talked about this yesterday. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Well, the keeping it holy is actually the important part. Um, what matters, what matters is that... Uh, God is here for us because we cannot make ourselves holy, but he can make us holy. And he does it on the Sabbath day. My friend Sarah just told me that everybody's laughing at me, laugh at myself. That's called high school. I was there four years of it. I can handle another 45 minutes. Uh, let's jump back in John chapter five, verse 19. We're going to keep going. Jesus says to these Jews who would criticize him, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these he will show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also will the Son give life to those whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. 
For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. That's probably plenty. So, um... We talked a little bit about this last time. Let's zoom in on my ADHD here. Uh, as we deal with uh, the son who would relate himself to the father, uh, we want to be careful whenever we start to deal with the Holy Trinity that we would sort of check our logic underneath the scriptures. Uh, because after all, a God that you can perfectly get your head around is a very tiny God. Most of you can't understand calculus. If you can't understand calculus and you can perfectly understand the Trinity and unity and unity and Trinity, your God is very tiny and you need a much better God. So recognize that it's okay if God is a little bit bigger than us and sometimes we just have to say, okay, by faith, Lord, I'm, I'm going to hear you and, and say amen. Uh, but when we deal with this, it's very clear that the Son does not want to be... Um, considered to be less than the Father. And the Father does not want the Son to be considered less than the Father. They are um, co-equal in glory and majesty. And so we get this big, long um, diatribe where we actually talk about uh, Jesus claiming to be divine. Uh, we actually get Jesus by verse by verse uh, recognizing attributes of God and applying them both to the Father and also to himself. Uh, and so last uh, yesterday we talked a little bit about sort of the, the Apostles' Creed, which would say, you know, God the Father created, God the Son redeemed, and God the Holy Spirit sanctified. And, and those aren't wrong, uh, but they're also a little bit simplistic. They're, they're good for children. But we who uh, would, would grow up to then confess the Athanasian Creed uh, would recognize that, well, the Father does nothing without the Son. The Son does nothing without the Father. The economy of the, Trin the, economy of the Trinity, it, it's, it's complex, but um, really the chief difference between the, the Father and the Son is not that the Son didn't have anything to do with creation and the Father didn't have anything to do with redemption, after all. Uh, as we see here, uh, the Son does nothing on his own and the Father sent the Son um, so, that, uh, so that these things would, uh, would be given uh, to the glory of the triune God co-equally. Felicity, how you doing? Carol, how's it going? Um, what we basically say then is the difference between the Father and the Son is that the Father is not made nor created nor begotten, as we confess in the Athanasian Creed. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. And the Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. That means Jesus is God. It's very fancy. If you, if you memorize the creeds, you can't mess up when you talk about God. It's, it's actually handy. Uh, it, it's an important thing because every once in a while, somebody will ask you, who is Jesus? And, well, you should actually be able to say quite simply, Jesus is Lord. Uh, but when, when we get sort of pushed on that, we can go to John chapter 5. Uh, beginning at, at, at uh, verse 19, uh, we see, uh, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does... That the Son does likewise. So Jesus says he has the same will as the Father. And this is a, a good gift. Not only do we have a God who is at work on the Sabbath day for you, because after all, uh, in, in verse 17, uh, the Father was working and Jesus is now working. Uh, it's not that the Father tags out and, and Jesus tags in. It's now we can actually see what the Sabbath day is all about. Because we can actually see God working in an incarnate way, in a, in a physical, on, in a certain place way. So I know what the Sabbath day is for. It's for me to be near God. And here, God comes down to me so that I don't have to climb up to God. If the Sabbath day is just watching Netflix, you will never get closer to God. And even worse, if the Sabbath day is somehow climbing your way up into heaven to spend an hour with God only then to come back down to earth, first, I can't get to heaven. And even if I could, why would I ever want to leave it just to come back down to my life? Instead, God comes down to dwell with us. And here, the Son starts to work bodily. Now Jesus is working because he has the same will as God the Father. The claim that the Son of God would make is not that he is less than God, but equal to God. The Jesus who you are dealing with is the way that you can start to understand who the Father is. And here, here we actually then have something uh, wonderful in that when we can start to talk about God, we can talk about a God who not only has a will, but shows us what it is, who, who not only has thoughts, but starts to tell us some of them, who, who not only um, ha has action, but displays it gloriously for us, even as Christ is given over to be crucified. What I mean is you don't have to understand who God is by like piercing some mystery. You don't have to try and guess who God is. If you want to better understand the Father, look to the Son. 
If you can understand what the Son is about because he tells you, you can actually understand the will of the Father because they, again, have the same will. Uh, this will pop up again in verse 30. We'll get there. But really what you see in all of this, in, in verse uh, 17, uh, he has the same work, the Son, as the Father. In, in verse 19, uh, he, he, he has the same will uh, of the Father. Uh, the Son is doing nothing on his own terms, on his own accord. Um, not the Honda, but, but like his, his, own, um, his own wanting to do a thing. He sees what the Father is doing, and he does likewise. Uh, and what's wonderful is when we see what the Son is doing, we can see what the Father is doing. There's a wonderful verse in 2 Corinthians, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. It means that if you actually want to start to understand God, don't start with the Father, and don't start with the Holy Spirit. If you want to start to understand who God is, look to the person of the Son, who reveals to us the Father. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. And then look to the Holy Spirit where Jesus promises to send uh, to you in, in means, in word and sacrament, so that we can receive the Son. To understand who the Son is, is to expect the Holy Spirit in word and sacrament. To understand who the Son is, is to know the Father and all of the mercy that he would have be your own. Uh, they, the Father and the Son have the same will, but also the same revelation. Let's keep going in John 5.20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him that you will marvel. So the Father wants to reveal to the Son something that you would better understand both of them. The Father doesn't reveal directly to you. The Father reveals to the Son who then reveals it to you. This is, this is how we can actually, again, start to get our heads around a God who is so much bigger than us that he clothes himself in flesh so that we can interact with him, so that we can receive from him. God who is infinite places himself in the finite so that we can receive him. He, he does this even as, as uh, the, the two natures of Christ are, are, um, are, are made one in, in the person, the Godhead, of, uh, the God-man of Jesus Christ, even as uh, we, we can see it in the sacrament in the same way, where it, it is uh, both the, the finite and the infinite made one in bread for you to eat and drink. It, it is his body in, with, and under bread. It, is it bread? Yes. Is it his body? Yes. You eat the body of Christ because... God joins himself to something very small so that you can receive something very big. It, it, it sounds complex, but really it's not. It, it, it's just that God doesn't want to be far apart from you. And if your tiny little brain has trouble with that, he'll put himself in something tiny and little. And this is for people like me who really struggle with this stuff because uh, I will go looking for God in all kinds of places. And so instead he places himself in the person of the Son and in the means of grace where the Son would be revealed to us by the person of the Spirit. If you want to start to see where this plays itself out, the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these he will show him that you may marvel. The Father shows the Son law and gospel. That's what he shows him. The Father shows the Son law and gospel because he shows the Son being on both ends of, of the judgment seat. Um, this is, this is not then the Father who is angry and the Son who is loving. This is the Father's love displayed to the Son and then through the Son. It's not that God the Father is mad at you and God the Son just uh, wants everybody to get along and have a nice party. It's that God is love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father's law and gospel is displayed through Jesus as he sits on both sides of the judgment seat. Re remember, he, he sits before Pilate on the receiving end of the judgment seat, and he is declared guilty for all of the sins of all of the world. He is declared guilty before God, and he is punished on the cross, but he is also promised to come again in glory on the last day to judge the living and the dead. The first makes the second not scary. The first means the second is a gift. See, if Jesus already received the judgment for the sins of the world, then when he comes on the last day, we can actually start to deal with him uh, according to, uh, well, 524. Whoever believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has already, has already passed from death to life. 
and then we can face judgment. Uh, we'll, we'll get there, but Christians do good works, and those who have done good will, will enter into glory, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. But here's the thing, that's where all of your evil went. You've done no evil. Jesus did it all. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, so that through him we might become the righteousness of God. In all of this, we have the Father's mercy, and that he would love the Son enough to let him partake of his most glorious, glorious action, the saving of, of sinners. See, it's not simply that the Father casts off the Son and despises him. The Father loves the Son so much that he lets him help with the most wonderful part of, of, of everything. He, he gets to actually be the one who would atone for the sin of the world. He, he gets to be the, the one through whom we would receive love, even as we are shown love. Uh, the revelation of God happens when Jesus is crucified. You can see both the, the law and the gospel come together. You can see both God's wrath and God's mercy come together as Christ is crucified for sinners. Here, he, he shows both that sin is not okay, sin breaks stuff, and sin has to be punished, but also he would not have you punished. He sends forth his own son. He bears the punishment himself, and he gives you mercy. He gives you love. He dies that you would have resurrection. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to those whom he will. The resurrection then uh, comes through the Father, through the Son. Uh, from the Father, through the Son, excuse me. And remember, it's, it's, it's not a limited resurrection. It's not a limited scope of a resurrection either. Um, when, when it says the Son gives life to whom he will, when these are the words of our Lord, remember who the Son wishes to give life to. Uh, we, we can go to John 3.17. We did this one here in John. Uh, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Son wills all to live. It's not that there's a, a limited atonement. It, it, it's not that God says, like, you and you and you are cool. You're in, but you, you're out. It's that God wills all to be saved, which is why he bears the sins of all upon the cross, which is why the act of love for all of the world is Christ who is crucified for all of the world. Because God does wish to see all of the world in the resurrection. It happens in a specific place, though. It's wonderful. It doesn't happen independent of God. And that's a good thing. See, we, we sort of say, well, if, if God really wanted everyone to be saved, why would he, he limit it to those who would believe in him? Well, we would answer, because if you have resurrection independent of the Father, you have resurrection independent of the Father's work. If you have resurrection independent of God, you have to get there yourself. If you have resurrection independent of the cross of Christ, it's your job to die and rise again. And we have history has proved, been pretty bad at that. Like, just look. This is why people struggle with the resurrection, because all of us die and don't get up again. If you want to divorce your resurrection from Christ's resurrection, best of luck. We're not doing this to make the kingdom smaller, but to make it larger. God is saying the resurrection is free and for you and for all, and it happens simply by believing in him whom the Father has sent. Here, you're already passed from death to life. Here, you're already a part of the resurrection because he did the thing you could not do. He died and then rose again. The resurrection that we have is not independent of the Father, but it is dependent upon the Father, which means God has already accomplished the resurrection for you. Yes, Connie, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. And so the Father would also not simply say, figure it out, but he sends the Holy Spirit. The Son does not simply say, uh, imagine yourself walking with me and talking with me. But he sends the Holy Spirit so that e even though we cannot come to God, he still does come to us. So even as the Son came down from heaven, the Son sends forth the Spirit that through preaching, through the hearing of his word, many would be brought to faith. A and so it's not your job to figure this out. It's just your job to receive it and rejoice. Your resurrection is even here, not independent of the Father. The Father sends the Spirit with the Son, and by their work, we are brought to faith. A resurrection that's independent of the Father means not only do you have to figure out how to die and rise again, but even here, you would have to figure out how to believe. But, well, um, I cannot by my own reason or strength, says our catechism. Um, 
or to go to the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 2, we are dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked. Dead people don't make good choices. They don't make any choices. They're, they're dead. Paul is not using a, a, um, the, the language incidentally or accidentally. He, he knows what he's saying. If you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, you have to be resurrected, made alive. For by grace, he has raised us up and seated us with him. Again, Ephesians chapter 2. All of our resurrection is tied to the work being shown here, done here for you by God. God is the worker. We are the receiver. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that, that changes what judgment will be. Um, if we can actually recognize that, that it is God who wills mercy, both the Father, the Son, and also the Holy Spirit, then as we, we deal with God, um, we can deal with the God who bore the cross for us so that when we come to stand before the judgment seat, we can simply point to the cross and say, that, 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 please, just the cross. Um, I don't want to be judged by my works. Will be, but I don't want to be. But my, my hope, my joy, my peace is that even though um, we are judged by our works, even by this verse, well, who does it? Who is it that does the good works through you? It's, it's the Holy Spirit. For we were created for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Uh, God has washed us. He has made us holy so that we would first live. We talked about this yesterday also. If we revisit my ADHD over here. Uh, remember as he deals uh, with this man who was um, paralyzed, who, who wanted to, to very much go down into um, the pool of, of Bethsaida and, and receive his healing. Jesus first tells him, rise. Uh, and then take up your bed and walk. First, you are given an identity. First, you are tied to the resurrection. And then, and only then, uh, are you actually being uh, given a, a, a gift. Um, and then he'll tell this man, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Um, and, and again, remember um, that before God would ever give him the command, he has first given him the identity. He says, you are whole, you are well. Now, this is what whole is. If you are already resurrected, raised up. Your identity is no longer bound to sin. Your identity is free in Christ. Uh, simply be that which God has made you to be. Uh, that will be shaped by the law, absolutely. Uh, but, but the power to get it done was given already in that identity where God would bestow it. In every single case, uh, God is the giver. Uh, and, and he gives to us gifts of mercy. Let's keep going. Uh, five, twenty. Three, uh, 22 to get the whole sentence. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And so as we, we honor the Son, um, we can also then find him as the center of our worship. Uh, we, we can say to, to, uh, to, to worship God, to receive good gifts from God in time and space, to, to worship, is to Worship the Father. Uh, again, this is why uh, in your cross, or excuse me, in your sanctuary, uh, hanging up there should be a, a big cross. And, and maybe, even just maybe, a, a, there should be a big dead Jesus on it. Uh, the, the crucifix is where uh, we, we honor both the Son and the Father because it was both of them who, who worked this love for us here. Uh, and, and he would continue, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And again, note the tense, not will pass. Not if you well, are well behaved pass, but you're already there. By faith, you are saved. By faith, you are right now saved. You have been saved and you are saved right now. This is who you are in Christ. Jesus is the word who speaks the word. And so the word made flesh to dwell among us tells you, this is who I am. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we, we believe him who tells us about himself. Because the word that reveals is also the word that creates. The, the word that, that tells us about who Jesus is is the same word that made the heavens and the earth. The word that then calls you holy is a word that has power. All this is, is big brain language. But that means that when God speaks to you and about you, Everything sort of knits itself together the way he talks. So you are not a sinner. You are holy. 
You are loved. You are saved. You have already passed from death to life because the son said so. And he gets what he wants. Let there be light. It was light. It is that word that the word would speak to you. We hear the word and we become what the word speaks. And so if by simply the, the hearing and receiving of God's word, it can't be by works. It can't be by works that we are saved. Truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And even our belief, as Connie pointed out, is God working through us. I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. It is God who does all of these things. Um, and, and that again it, it explains why we've got this big, long, confusing text. If Jesus is just saying, be good like me, why does he want to equate himself to the Father, which is so much bigger than us? Jesus is not going over and over this, uh, over and over to the Jews saying, this is who I am, equal to the Father, so that he might turn around and say, be more like me. He's trying to prove to them that they can't, that the fulfillment of the Sabbath day isn't their work, but God's work for us. On the Sabbath day, we receive the fulfillment of the commandment. The third commandment is to receive God's gifts. And this is how sinful we are. That the third commandment, which is literally just rest with God, receive his gifts, go to church. We're like, yeah, but waffles. I love waffles. Waffles might be better. No, no. Um, so God in his mercy wouldn't let this hinge on my ability. He puts it all on his ability ability and his identity and then he bestows from his identity an identity to you who are you were you uncalled by the gospel and well when you're called you go faith in jesus goes to jesus it does this is what it this is what it is this is how it works uh here here god is uh, at work to to give you uh not just gifts but but an identity that that comes with them um So let's, let's keep going with this. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Hey, Pastor Borkhardt, how you doing? Uh, thanks for, for letting me talk at a screen and laugh to myself uh, while my friends laugh at me this day. Hope you're doing well. Um, <laughs> there's a resurrection. The, the resurrection is both of the dead and for the dead. Uh, the, the resurrection is the resurrection of the dead. The dead in Christ will rise. But the resurrection is also then for the people who can't save themselves, for the people who can't escape that last great enemy death. This is a wonderful thing. Um, this is not just a metaphor. This is not just a spiritual thing. Uh, God has actually promised that, that in this life, you who are overwhelmed by not just the sinful flesh, but also the pains of this world, you who cannot escape the, the things that happen in this world, you don't have to measure God's love by your ability to get away from them. You have to measure God's love by his ability to endure them for you and then rise again from the dead because you will also rise in your body. You will also rise in your body because the, the God who promises resurrection uh, delivers it. The, the son it has been granted uh, to have life and he bestows that very same life to you. He who has conquered death gives you his victory. And so all of Christianity isn't just be nice, go to a nice place, or be good, go to the good place. It is die with Jesus, rise with Jesus. Heaven isn't just sort of a, a cloud where there's nothing wrong and we don't need God anymore, but we finally get to be around him. Heaven is wherever Jesus is, and Jesus places himself even into this dying world so that heaven would be brought to earth, and we who are dying in the midst of our sins would be given life so that we would hope for the resurrection. I will hope for a new body that won't be burdened by the pains of this world and all the things that I can't escape. The resurrection is for the dead, and so if we are dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked, thanks be to God, because he rescues the dead. He gives them life. He gives you life. 
Jesus only died for the dying and the dead. If you can live all by yourself, what does he need to bear the cross for you for? Just don't go near the cross. The cross hurts. But if you can't escape death, if you can't escape wrath by your own works, rejoice because God has borne that for you. He has borne your wrath, that which you have earned. He has borne your death, that which is the wages of your sin. And he gives you his life. For the Father has life in himself, and so he has granted that the Son also to have life in himself. He has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So don't marvel at this. For the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And this verse right here cannot be divorced from everything that we just did. You can't just cherry pick this verse and say, if you are well behaved, you go to heaven. And if you are poorly behaved, you go to hell. If you are well behaved, you get the resurrection. And if you are, are naughty, you, you go to, to hell. No, we, we just established that if you have believed in him who the Father has sent, you have already been judged. You have already passed from death to life. And so here, take how we deal with this verse in light of how we deal with the others. You have no sins left. Jesus took them all. Your sins are gone. And he does good works through you. And then he gives you credit for them. This is a twofer. That's a theological term. Twofer. God takes away all your sins so that you won't be punished. Does good works through you so that you would be rewarded. God does all of it. And he gives you the gift. This is, this is how we start to deal with the last day. I can't wait for it. Um, it, it's going to be shocking because I'm going to hear about some stuff I don't realize I, I did. I'm going to hear about some stuff that I'm so happy that God did through me. A, and in all of it, I'm not going to hear about my sins because I already hear about them. I, I know them. I, I take them to the cross and I leave them there. And that's where I hear about my sins. You don't hear about your sins on judgment day. You hear about your sins as the sun cries out, it is finished. They're gone. He atoned for them. The judgment is judged. The son was guilty. You are holy. This is where we deal with our sins. Always here. <sighs> Lukewarm coffee break. All right. Let's keep going. John 30. How are we doing on time? We got time. Jesus said, uh, John 5, 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is judge, just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. So there is another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works of the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe in the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive my glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from God? Let's talk about that. Because, again, just lot. <laughs> so, that it would not just be Jesus crying out by himself in the wilderness. God sends John. Because uh, uh, the the... the testimony should be accompanied by two or three witnesses. So it's not just Jesus on his own crying out these things, and it's also not just John on his own crying out all these things. God in his mercy sent John, though the witness of John was to point to Jesus. Now it's two. Jesus spoke through John, even as John witnessed about Jesus. Jesus preaches through John so that people would believe in Jesus. He, he brings about the extra witness that he needs. He, he establishes his truth that we would see it and receive it and start to understand who our God is. See, God does not want his will hidden. God does not want his identity hidden. He reveals himself in the person of Jesus. And even as he, he is incarnate, even as the word is made flesh to dwell among us, he sends forth words to bear witness about the word. 
he says, I'm going to, through the way that I've always worked, continue to point to myself. Because God's identity should not be a surprise. All of the scriptures bear witness to this. And what's wonderful is you can see that same thing being happened, or that, that same thing still happening today. Uh, the witness of John was not John working independently of God, but God working through John to establish that that which is going on in Jesus is, is true. It happens today through your pastor too. Jesus preaches through men to save sinners. Jesus preaches through sinful men to save sinners. And that's wonderful because that means that it's not up to John to come up with the right stuff. John was a weird dude, wore weird clothes, ate weird food, said angry things. Uh, by every standard today, John, not a good pastor. That probably says more about our standards about pastors than it does about John, though, so don't don't be too too hard on the guy. I'm just saying, like, if uh, John the Baptist would get tossed out of your church, uh, you should reevaluate some things. Putting that out there. Just saying. Jesus himself says there's no one greater than John. If John's way of doing things, and you're like, man, I can't handle this even though it's God's word. Reevaluate, repent, rejoice that God would come to you through sinners. Because if you're waiting for somebody who's not a sinner to come and bring you Jesus, keep waiting. Sorry. This is the hand we're dealt. What a mercy is it is, a gift it is that God would play it anyway. Uh, the, the whole thing isn't dependent on the preacher, but upon the works of Jesus. And this is why the preachers wear vestments. This is why we wear stoles. We are yoked to his death and resurrection. We are yoked to his words. Speak these words. Preach law and gospels. His truth. His identity. His mercy. His forgiveness. Give them these gifts. Point not to yourself, not to other people's works, but to Jesus. This is what the preacher does. But even as the preacher preaches, Jesus preaches through him. The word still creates. The word which spoke in the beginning, the word which was made flesh, that's the same word you hear on Sunday morning when you're like sleepy and thinking about lunch. It's okay, it still works. The Holy Spirit is behind this. It doesn't mean you should despise preaching. In fact, we should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear it and learn it. And this is why. The word that you're gladly hearing and learning, it's, it's God's word. It, it's your salvation. It is death and resurrection delivered to you that you would have the same. John is sent to bear witness uh, about God. Um, and he doesn't do it independently. He doesn't do it independently of God who would work through him, but he also doesn't do it independently of all of the other things that, that are happening. Um, and so Jesus says, you search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life. And I tell you the truth, it is they that bear witness about me. This is one of my favorite Bible verses because it tells you really simply the Bible's about Jesus. It, it's an important thing to remember uh, because so often when we, when we read the scriptures, the first thing that we go looking for isn't Jesus. When we read the Bible, that's God's word about God. The first thing that we look for is our favorite thing. It's, it, I look for me. You look for you. We look for ourselves. Uh, you search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life. The Pharisees, the, the Jews, the scribes, they were, they were diving through the scriptures. They knew how to quote the Bible. But every time they went looking in it, they only went looking for themselves. What can I do to be saved? Well, they bear witness about me what I will do to save you, what I have done to save you. All of the scriptures testify of Jesus. So that means when we read the scriptures and, and in them we find no Jesus, we're doing it wrong and we need to start over. Jesus is in every page, in every letter. All of the scriptures are pointing to Jesus. Even, even, even the law given for you to do. That, that's about Jesus too. That doesn't negate it. That doesn't make it go away. And those are good because if they're about Jesus, we don't want a Jesus who is negated or a Jesus who goes away. We, we want a Jesus who fulfills the law for us, even as he gives us rules, laws that, that testify of his own character. All of the Bible is about Jesus. The law, fulfilled by Jesus for you. The gospel, Jesus dying on the cross for you. The Old Testament, all about Jesus for you. We did Genesis. There was a lot of Jesus in Genesis. It was pretty cool. I hope you were there for some of it, all of it. It's wonderful. The entire Bible is about Jesus. Every self-help book masquerading under Christianity sold at Barnes and Noble or Borders or Amazon because nobody actually goes into bookstores anymore. Uh, 
they, they fall apart under this because all of those sort of like Christian-y books about how to get your life in order or how to, you know, do your finances uh, and how to, you know, succeed at work and how to build a better family, every last one would take the scriptures and say, okay, Jesus, thank you for showing me how to do my stuff. And now we make the scriptures testify about us instead of him. And then we lose sort of the whole point. And I'm not saying you can't find out how to behave from the scriptures. You very clearly can. There's 10 simple rules that you're doing terrible at. I don't know why you need more of them. But I am saying that when you remove Jesus from the core of the scriptures, all you have are 10 simple rules that you can't actually follow. That's why they keep writing those books. You ever notice how many Christian self-help books there are? That's not just because the people writing them want more money. That's also because the last one didn't work. If they ever wrote a Christian self-help book that actually worked, they could stop writing them. People would just buy that one. They could even try to write more, but people would just buy the one that actually works. The reason that they keep pumping these books out over and over again is because there's people desperate to try and find a way to fulfill this themselves, and they're all failing. In all of it, the scriptures testify of Jesus. Jesus doesn't receive glory from people. He receives it on the cross. 542, let's finish out the chapter. Um, how far did we get? Let's start here. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive the glory from another and do not seek the glory that comes from only from God? From the only God, excuse me. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Let's, let's talk about love. Um, I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Because the law that the Jews were doing wasn't actually about their neighbor. It was always about themselves. The law apart from love never serves the neighbor. The law apart from love only ever serves the self. Um, when, when you have just, just rules, uh, well, rules are a part of any game. But the purpose of the game isn't to help other people. The purpose of the game is to win, at least in my house, uh, which is why I don't take it easy on my kids when we play board games. I destroy them. Uh, the days are coming, says the Lord, when they will turn the tables because uh, all of my, both of my kids are smarter than me and um, pretty soon, pretty soon they're going to figure out how to do this. The law apart from love never serves the neighbor. Um, it, it changes then the definitions of the commandments. Uh, it, we, we, should, uh, we should fear and love God. That's how the meanings of all the, the commandments go in your catechism, right? Uh, the law apart from love never serves the neighbor. But all the commandments, so fourth through tenth um, in the second table, they always start with we should fear and love God so that we can actually be free to love our neighbor. We can actually uh, find our glory from the Father and not from our own works. See, if, if love is given to you from the Father, you already have value in the Father's eyes. You don't need to earn value. You already have glory in Christ who has borne your, your shame upon the cross. So you don't need to earn respect by doing good things. Now, you, you should fear and love God so that you would be absolutely free to not care so much about yourself. Um, because the, the, the Jews, uh, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, everybody who Jesus rails against here, they only do these things for their own glory. You should fear and love God so that you would be free not to have to earn your glory. We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. What if God actually didn't want to see your neighbor suffer? We should fear and love God uh, so that we would lead a chaste and decent life in what we say and do and husband and wife love and honor each other. What if God actually wants healthy, happy families and encourages these things? Uh, we should fear and love God so that we do not uh, take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but instead help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. What if God actually wants your neighbor's stuff taken care of and to stay their stuff? The Eighth Commandment, to, to defend their reputation. We're running out of time, uh, so we're, we're going to kind of just recognize here uh, the, the great gift of love is that it makes the law not about you and what you can earn. It, it makes it uh, simply a, a picture of what love looks like because love always looks like something. Love is never just sort of a, an emotion that you 
direct towards somebody. It always has a form and shape. For God so loved the world that it looked like something. It looked like a cross. Well, the law is what love looks like when it's put in action towards your neighbor. And here you are free to, to love your neighbor and not worry about yourself because you have love from God. It's a very apparent when, when this love is not actually within you because the, the law then becomes your tool, your weapon, your leverage as opposed to a gift that would help you understand what love looks like as you look to your neighbor. Um, which is sort of the problem. Because when I look to my neighbor, when I look to the law of Moses, understand that Moses never says, a boy." Moses never says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Moses always accuses. He does. Moses always accuses. Um... <laughs> Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, the, the giver of the Ten Commandments, on whom you have set your hope. Jesus isn't here to judge you based on the law. He's here to be judged because you, you didn't fulfill the law. He's here to be judged, DLT, that you would be forgiven. If you want to set your hope on Moses, Moses will always accuse you. The law always accuses. To hope in the law is different than to hope in the giver of the law. To hope in the law is to say, I can earn this, I can do this, I can play by these rules and win the prize. To hope in the giver of the law is the God who not only gave you the law as a good gift, but actually fulfills it for you in your stead and gives you the blessings from it. Moses did intercede for his people. It's true, but he also lamented them. He complained about them a lot. The thing that sustained them in the desert wasn't Moses. It was the mercy of God. The people complained to God about Moses. God complained to, or I mean, uh, the people complained to God about Moses. Moses complained to God about the people. God got frustrated by all of it, but it was his mercy that sustained them. Because if God were to simply strike down everyone who complained, everyone who sinned, everyone who didn't live up to the Ten Commandments that Moses was sent down the mountain with, there would be no one brought into the Promised Land. But God, being rich in mercy, loved us forgave us, saved us. To hope in the law is futile. Moses never says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But to hope in the law giver is to hope in Christ, who does say that to you, has said that to you. For he was judged, your sin is forgiven, and you, on the last day, when you are judged and stand before the seat, will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not by your doing of the law, but by your receiving of the gospel. That's chapter 5. Uh... You got pa Pastor Borkhart tomorrow with chapter 6. I think that's pretty good. Y'all have a great day. God bless. Bye.